Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff, and I'll be your host for the show. Before we bring on tonight's guest, if you've had a Dogman Encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. If you've had a Sasquatch sighting and would like to be a guest on Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio, please go to bigfooteyewitness.com and submit a report. All right, let's bring on tonight's guest. Tonight's guest wishes to remain anonymous. With that in mind, I'm just going to refer to him as Kyle tonight. Kyle, welcome to the show. Thanks, Vic. It's nice to be here. Oh, it's great having you. Thanks for your time and thanks for coming on. Kyle, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Well, I grew up in the foothills of eastern Kentucky at the base of the Appalachian Mountains. And I'm going to give you a description of my upbringing because that's what's made me into the man I am today. And it's an important part of my life, remembering where I came from. I grew up on a farm close to the Daniel Boone National Forest. It wasn't very far. I'd say maximum six miles. Maximum. And I grew up doing a lot of stuff that some people may not have done because I grew up in a country lifestyle where uh, the value of a dollar was also how I had my fun. And uh, I did a lot of root digging, like I dug for ginseng, yellow root, blood root, rattle weed, and I'd make a few dollars here and there. Uh, most of it went to my papa, who I spent the majority of my childhood with. And most of the time, I feel like I probably got gypped, and he probably made a lot more of the money than I did, but I didn't care because that's part of it. I worked in tobacco fields. I worked in the hay. I'd go back in the woods and I'd cut poke greens, bring it home to my mama. She cut them poke greens up into poke salad. It's a wild vegetable here in the mountains. It might be everywhere. I'm not sure. But as far as I know, it's it's in the mountains. And uh, I waded creeks and I set turtle traps and I sang for chub minnows and horny heads. After a good rainfall, I'd scrape together some, a few night crawlers and red worms. My papa would go to town twice a week. And whenever he went to town, I'd take the turtles in and the, all the, the bait that I caught in. He'd go to the feed store. When he'd go to the feed store, I'd take everything that I caught in. And next to the feed store was a bait shop. I'd take all those live bait that I caught besides the turtle. And I'd sell the live bait for a few dollars, not very much altogether. I mean, I could come up with 24 dozen night crawlers and only get just a couple dollars. And the turtles I'd sell five or six dollars if it was a good one. And from the bait shop, they'd sell them to other people and those other people would would eat them. And then I'd take that money. I'd make sure, you know, I had the most I, I could come up with. And just a few blocks down the road there, I guess you can call them blocks, there was a video store. I'd go in there and I'd make sure that I had enough money to pay for the late fee because I knew it was going to be at least three days before I came back to the video store when my papa come back in to get more feed for his chickens and his ducks. And he had a few cows, but he always kept horses. And uh, so I'd go in there, pick out a movie. That's as close as I got to the big city life was written a, a movie from the video store of town. And uh, we'd go to church every Sunday. I had a lot of cousins I grew up with. That's how I learned to fight. And uh, that's also how I learned to run because we wouldn't let to hit no women. And the girl cousins were the worst ones to fight. Also, as I got older, my dad would take me out into the woods and teach me about the Daniel Boone, how to get back home if I ever got turned around. I feel pretty confident that I can just about be dropped in any any neck of the woods, not only in this state, but just about any, maybe not Alaska, but just about any, and find my way back to civilization somewhere, somehow. And uh, I squirrel hunted a lot. That's the first time I learned to shoot was at a squirrel. And a rabbit hunted a lot. And we trained a lot of squirrel dogs and rabbit dogs. And coon hounds. Whenever I say coon hounds, I mean rat coon hounds. Like, uh, there's certain types of, of breeds. You got your walkers, your red ticks, your black and tans, 
um, your plots, curves, fice, even some some fice, even though they're more considered a squirrel dog. But that's part of it. You know, I grew up country, and I'm proud of it. I wouldn't trade it for nothing. There wasn't a whole lot of work around where I grew up at, so you either went a couple counties over to the east and you worked in the coal mines, or you went more towards the central Kentucky, which, you know, 45 minutes, an hour, hour and a half, two hours, depending on what part, and you got a job working in a factory somewhere if you didn't go to college, and I'm from a military background. Uh, my great grandfather was World War One. My grandfather was a, a POW, Battle of the Bulge. My cousin served in Vietnam. He did three tours of duty as Green Bray. I'm from pretty tough stock. And my father was in, in uh, Desert Storm. And unfortunately, it could be a good thing, could be a bad thing. The line broke with me. I did not serve in the military. I respect the military, have the utmost respect for the military. That's country living. But the main most things we done when we got the chance, when the whippoorwill started singing and you hear them tree frogs croaking, start seeing the lightning bugs come out. The main most thing that we done, we hit the woods when it got close to dark, got the dogs ready to go, and we go coon hunting. When I say coon hunting, I mean raccoon hunting. And, uh, we, we trained our dogs by voice command. Every dog we ever trained was trained by voice command because we hunted in one spot and one spot only. And that was the Daniel Boone National Forest. And the Daniel Boone National Forest is acres upon acres of wildlife. It's some of the roughest terrain. It's in the Appalachian Mountains. That I mean, it's got everything from some flats. It's got lakes. got a couple lakes on it, the part that I always grew up hunting. It's got two different lakes that I know of. The part that I grew up on. And uh, it's got several different species of trees and wildlife, ginseng. There's about the biggest thing in this country it would be a, a black bear, which you still don't see very many of those. And they're pretty scared of people. I mean, they'll, they'll follow you and stuff if they got cubs and they feel like they're threatened, but most of the time they're not a huge threat. And here recently, the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife have uh, introduced elk in the area. So that's not a predator, but it's also a pretty big species for this area. Bobcats are also in the area. Um, some say that mountain lion are in the area, and I also believe that because I, I have actually seen one, and I have a picture of them on trail cam, despite what the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife says. That's all the main predators I can think of besides coyote. And I do not actually consider them a huge predator because in this area that I live, coyotes have been hunted hard even before there was a law that made it open season. They have always been hunted hard. People poach. I say poach. That means that they kill these animals out of season or because they're, they kill a lot of livestock, you know, lambs and calves and horses horses are really big in this area so they've always been hunted hard they're scared to death of people i mean absolutely terrified of people because the ones that are left which is not many in this area have adapted to humans so well that when they see them they run and majority of time they're nocturnal they don't you don't see them in the daytime and you definitely do not see them in the flatland every once in a while you might see one up in the mountains or up in Daniel Boone, but even then, they're so scared to death of people that they will run with every ounce of energy that they have. With that being said, the same thing goes at night. If you walk upon one, you shine a flashlight on one. They run as fast as they can, as hard as they can to try to get away from you. I myself have never been a coyote hunter or a predator hunter. As close as predator hunting as I've ever gotten close to is probably been raccoon hunting or coon hunting. I'm just going to say coon hunting because that's how we say it here. It sounds like you didn't have an easy childhood, but it was a good one in my opinion. Yeah, it was. I mean, I grew up, my mom said I came out of the womb with calluses on my hands. 
And I, that law still holds true to me because I still have them. <laughs> yeah, I believe it. You had reservations about coming on the show and sharing your encounters with the listeners, and understandably so because of how ridiculously intense your first encounter was. Considering that, what made you decide to do this? One of my buddies, I'm not going to name him, we were fishing one day. This is only a couple of weeks ago. I'm relatively new to the show, and I, I didn't know much about the show, and I didn't know that there were other people out there that have had experiences, not even close to mine or, or close to mine. You know, I still haven't listened to every episode, but what has made me come on the show was we were out fishing one day, and my buddy told me, he said, we'll call him Chris. My buddy Chris told me, he says, you've hunted these woods for a long time. We were fishing in Daniel Boone. He says, you've hunted these woods for a long time. And have you ever had any experiences or anything that you can't explain? And that's whenever I told him my story. And me and Chris are really good friends. I would consider him probably my best friend. He's not much of a bass fisher, but he's a really good friend. And so when I told him my story, he told me that that was the craziest thing he'd ever heard and that I needed to come on dogman encounters. And at that time, I didn't know what he was talking about. I said, so you mean there's others, you know? And that's the basis of, of how I ended up getting in touch with Vic. And now I'm, I'm glad I did. I'm so glad you found out about this show and, we were able to talk about those experiences and the fact that it's helped you so much. That's really good news. That's why I do this like I told you before. Yeah, I mean, this community in itself is something that people need. Not that they want or that it entertains them or it scares them. or It's something that people need because we don't have anyone besides each other to talk about our experiences with. Because if we do, to the majority of the public, they think that we're crazy. So there's someone there. It's something tangible that almost you can reach out and touch, and you know that it's real, and they know that it's real. And that's important not only for myself, but for other people who've had encounters or who have any similar situation. It doesn't even have to be the dog man. If there's one thing we can do as a community – it's help someone. If we can just help one person, one person, just one, then we've lived a life that's worth living. That's with everything in life. That's what I believe the most. Yeah, when you have a dogman encounter or encounters, such as in your case, and all of a sudden you find out there's an actual community of people out there who care about you and your ability to deal with those experiences, yeah, that definitely changes things. All right, Kyle, if you're ready, please tell us about your encounters now. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. Remember, take your time. There's no hurry. My encounter actually happened at night while I was coon hunting with my dogs. But before I get into what happened that night, I need to explain to everyone what coon hunting is. What coon hunting is, is you're taking your dogs out. And there are different breeds of hounds, like I said earlier. And you're, you, these dogs are trained. You've trained them from pups to track the scent of a raccoon. Those dogs run that raccoon, and they're barking. They, we call it tracking. That's important. We call it tracking the raccoon or tracking. And eventually, the, the raccoon will run so far away and think it's so far away and the dog will gain ground on it because hounds are faster than coons the coon will climb the tree most of the time it'll climb a tree sometimes it'll run into a den sometimes it'll find a hollow tree sometimes it'll bay up on the side of a creek bank and then once they most of the time run up a tree your dogs will track it to the tree and they'll start barking up the tree and when they do that that process is called training once they get treed and they have the location where they think that the raccoon is at, they'll sit in that one spot on that tree and they'll keep barking up the tree, treeing, 
until the hunter walks in or the handler, the owner of the hound, and will most of the time shoot the raccoon out. Raccoon falls out, the dog grabs a hold of it, brings it to you. One of the reasons why we done that was we were fur bearers. We wouldn't only fur bear raccoons, we fur bear mink, muskrat, just about any height of value back then. And I don't do it today, but back then. See, my grandfather, he was raised in a time where coon hunting very first came into this part of the country. And the reason why it came in, it came in in the, the late 50s, all the way through the 60s and into the early 70s. The reason why people would, would hunt raccoons with dogs was because of the rabies scare that we had. And raccoons can hold more types of diseases, including rabies, than most animals, most wild animals, and can transmit them. He even lost a couple of his pets as a child growing up due to the to the rabies. Rabies is uncurable to this day. You'll always have to take a shot from it if you get bit by an animal that has it. And you'll have to live with it. It's part of life. So coon hunting is a part of maintaining the habitat and maintaining wildlife and the population. And without coon hunting, even though that coon hunters now are a dying breed, unfortunately, there's just not as many of them. And even the game wardens here in Kentucky will tell you that coon hunters are dying breed, and most of the time, if you're a coon hunter, they'll leave you alone. The game wardens won't aggravate you because there's just not that many of them. With that being said, the population keeps growing and growing and growing, and there's a highly likelihood that rabies virus will be back in the country. My encounter is very, very difficult to talk about, and until this point, I haven't had any struggles, I feel, and I feel like Everything's went pretty good, but this is where it's going to get dark. And unfortunately, it was very traumatizing. And here we go. My encounter happened October 1st, 2003. I was 15 years old. It was the opening night of coon hunting season. So that night, my papa had called me up and asked me if I wanted to go. And he already knew that I, I definitely wanted to go. Most of the time I was there, but that night I wasn't. My mother drove me over and dropped me off. I didn't have my license yet, just 15. And it was dark at this point, or getting close to it. Right at dark, I'd say. And uh, my papa, he wasn't physically able to go get the dogs himself to load them up in the dog box that we kept in the back of the truck. So I always had to do it. I always had to do the grunt work, always. So my grandfather was very sick and wasn't able to. He loved to go and sit in the truck and listen to the dogs run and track and tree. He loved it. He loved it more than anything. That was his favorite pastime. So that night, I went and got the young dog. The young dog I have is a 14-month-old pup, even though, you know, by 14 months old, these, these dogs, these hounds are, are fully grown. Red tick named Bo. Bo was a beautiful red tick dog. I mean, absolutely gorgeous. Most of his body was was red, like like strawberry wine, just beautiful. Had a few specks on him, a few white specks, but most of him was red. Beautiful. I was training him, and how I'd train him is I'd take him out with the old dog, turn him loose, and he would learn running with the old dog. And then the second dog I went and got was our old dog, old Jake, and Jake was. A treeing walker coonhound. Around here, we just call them walkers, not treeing walkers, but that's the breed name. Beautiful dog. He was tricolor, meaning he's three different colors. He was black, white, and tan. He had a blanket back, white legs, white chest, white belly, white face. Beautiful dog. For his breed, the average weight is anywhere from 60 to let's say 80 pounds, every once in a while you run across 100 pounds. But he was a giant for his breed. He was 120 pounds, hoss, real wide, broad chest, broad shoulders. And Vic actually has some pictures of him that he can post up for everyone to see. And he was an absolute great hound. He had a really good nose on him. He could smell a track that of a, 
raccoon that went through the creek someplace 20 minutes ago to an hour ago. I mean, he's a great dog, and he was an excellent kill dog. When I say kill dog, I mean he had jaws like a pit bull. And when you coon hunt, sometimes you shoot the coon out to him, to the dogs. That doesn't necessarily mean that the coon's going to be dead. Sometimes they live, and the dog has to dispose of the animal. Jake was really good at that. He do it quick and as humanely as a dog possibly could, quick and to the point. And he was really, really tough. Here in the Daniel Boone, what happened several times, four to be exact, has been treated in the Daniel Boone, and there's been packs of coyotes that came in on him. Whenever I say they came in on him, they came into him while he was treated. And he would always hold his ground. Because in old Jake's mind, those coyotes weren't there to kill him, even though that's what they were there to do. Because when they heard him bark, in their minds, it would ring off meal ticket. I'm going to go in there and eat that dog that's treeing in the woods someplace. But in Jake's mind, them coyotes were coming in there to take that tree away from him and all that hard work he did to track that coon down. So on this particular night, we loaded up the dogs. It was a pretty chilly evening, and we headed into Daniel Boone National Forest. When we got in there to Daniel Boone National Forest, it was me and my grandfather. There was no one else with us. We took a road that's a six-mile road that goes way back into Daniel Boone, way back into Daniel Boone. I mean, way back in there for as far as location to the road, because it twists and turns and curves so many times. This road's only open five months out of the year, from October to February. That's it. Besides that, the road's locked. Can't get back in there unless it's foot travel. So it was the first night, October 1st. We went back in there, drove all the way to the end. It winds off several times. We took the lowest fork, went all the way deep as we could get. Because at this point, we'd gotten a little bit of a late start. There's already several other coon hunters out at the very beginning of the trail. So we had to go way deep back in there because we didn't want our dogs to cross tracks. And sometimes when they cross tracks, they end up getting together or they travel real far off or sometimes they even fight. The area we went to is at the very end of the road where the trailhead foot travel welcome sign starts again there's no more vehicle travel beyond that point no atv nothing and at that location it's all bramble lots of oaks white oaks black oaks red oaks and cliffs lots of cliffs that run in and intertwine with each other there's a creek running through a beautiful stream that flows down through there i've been out there several times in the daytime but I'd never been out there at night, and I'd never traveled very far in that location because it's just too far. It's too far off the beaten path. Once we got to the location where we were going to be coon hunting, I got out of the truck, grabbed a hold of old Jake and Bo, and I turned them loose. After I turned them loose, a short while after that, old Jake hit a track. He was burning it up. Bo was right there with him. Bo was doing pretty good in his training. You know, he's barking along with Jake on the ground. They're doing really good. They run the coon across the road. We couldn't see it. They run the track across the road up onto the top of the cliff that was just to our left. You could see the shadow. It was dark that night, but you can still see the shadow of the cliff and over the backside of the cliff. Then it wasn't too long after that that they got treed. This all happened within. 15 to 20 minutes. So I got out of the truck. My papa got out of the truck. We stood there for a minute, listened to him. My papa looked at me and he said, they're tree. You better get in there. I always walked in by myself because as I said, my papa had poor health. He wasn't able to walk very far. So we always had two-way radios. I'd take a radio with me. I'd leave a radio with him. I grabbed a hold of the gun in the back of the truck, toolbox, 
strapped it on my back, and away I went. I started traveling in there. They were a good 700 yards from us. As I'm walking in, you hear a pack of coyotes open up in the distance, start yipping, going on crazy. My coyotes do, and once they get the pack, it's a pretty good size pack, seven or eight. And the whole time you're hearing old Jake and Bo in their tree. They're really doing a real good tree job, I'm just burning it up. And my papa calls me on the radio and asks me if I hear them coyotes. I say, yeah, papa, I hear them. He says, well, you better get on in there. That way, if I get in there with a the light, if they get close, they're going to stay away because they see my light and they're scared to death of people. It's just the way it is here in this part of the country. So I start heading in there, getting pretty close, not not real close, but about halfway at this point. Hear that pack of coyotes again, they're close. When I say they're close, they're within 100, 200 yards. They're heading that way. They hear old Jake in their tree and, and bow, and they think it's their meal ticket. So they're heading there. That's the way they're going. So I call my papa, I'll get on the two-way radio. He says, you better get in there quick. And it wasn't just a few moments after that that the coyotes reached the tree that old Jake and Bo was training on. And old Jake didn't miss a lick. He just stayed right on the tree, just steady chopping, just y'all, 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 every breath. Didn't You could set your watch to Jake in there just chopping the tree down with his bark. So at least that's what he thought he was doing. And Bo would bark every once in a while. Them coyotes are yipping, hollering, circling around them and stuff. Directly, you hear Bo start squeaking and whimpering and stuff. One of them coyotes grab a hold of him, maybe two of them. I'm, I'm not, I don't know. They grab a hold of him. Once they grab a hold of him, you can hear him just heading out of the country, just running as fast as he can go, just whimpering like a devil's chasing him. And old Jake stays right there on the tree, just every breath, doesn't miss a beat. Just he's there, and to him, he's the big dog on campus, and they're they're not running him off. And he's held his ground many nights against them, not against that particular pack, but against other packs. And he's actually killed coyotes on the tree while he was treeing. You can hear them coyotes yipping, going on, squealing, making all kinds of crazy noise. And every once in a while, you hear one of them coyotes muster up the courage to go in on old Jake on the tree. And when they did, old Jake stopped training. He'd come off and grab a hold of them. And when he did, do you hear them coats squealing and squalling? Because like I said, he had jaws of death. So he locked down on them. They felt it. And then after one of them would whimper and go on, he'd go right back to the tree and start right back to training like they wasn't even there. After a few moments, them coyotes decided that they were going to go in on him two or three at a time. So they they started fighting with old Jake in there, and you could hear him then at that point whimpering a little bit because they were grabbing hold of him pretty good. My, at this point, my papa called me on a two-way radio, and he said, you better get in there. They're going to get him. So I start making my way in there, picking up my pace, going fast, trying to get in there. To hit that light, shine that light on them, hit them with it. And I know good and well that whenever that light hits them coyotes, they're going to run because they always have, always do at this point. Never has failed. Now, I've walked in there three or four times before, and it, the same thing happens every single time the coyotes go in on OJ. As soon as I get there, they run. It's just the way they are here. So as I start making my way in there, at this point, oh, oh, Jake's losing. You can hear them, hear them coyotes really putting it to him. I say losing, I mean, you know, they're they're trying to kill him. They've all went in on him as a, as a pack circled around him, and he's fighting them off. He's a pretty good sized pack. He'd never ran across a pack this big, and then. As I'm picking up my pace and going in there, all of a sudden the fight changes. And it's like, it's like Bo come back. 
he come back and was in there with old Jake fighting him, fighting that pack. And, you know, the table's turned and they're putting it on these coyotes. I mean, they're putting it to them. Them coyotes are screaming, squalling, carrying on crazy, like they're just getting killed in there. I pick up my pace and I ain't that far from them at this point. By the time the table's turned back in old Jake's favor. I walk in there and I shine my light and I hit old Jake with my light. Not hit him, hit him, but I shine my light directly on him. And he has one of them coyotes by the throat. As soon as I do that, I accidentally blind him. He turns loose the coyote and the coyote runs away. You start seeing the pack just scatter. I walk up to him, the old Jake. He's holding his paw up, you know, whimpering a little bit, hurt, but not, not too bad. He's, He's pretty good shape, pretty pretty stout dog, really muscular. He can handle a whole lot. He can take on a lot. So as I walk up to him, pet him and stuff, behind this great big black oak tree, it's big enough for two, maybe three people to hold hands. You probably couldn't touch the third person's hand all the way around. You just couldn't connect. I hear a, a coyote on the other side, a whimpering. And what I, what I call a blood gargle, gargling, just choking on its own blood. And at this time when I hear that, I ain't gonna lie to you. I'm a little bit proud. I'm thinking, oh, Bo really come in here and he helped him. I'm proud of him. He's, he's really come in here and helped him. I'm, I'm tickled to death. I walk around the oak tree, around the side of the oak tree. I walk around and shine my light, and that's when I see it. It's not Bo at all. It's a great big dog. When I say big dog, I mean it's as big as a St. Bernard, huge, wide, real wide. And it's looking at me, and it, and it has that coat by the chest on all fours. This dog is on all fours with that coat by the chest, and there ain't a – and this, this coat, it's holding – 40, 50 pounds, and there ain't a piece of that coyote's body that's touching the ground. He's holding that coyote up off the ground. I say he, but I don't know if it was he or she, but he's holding it up off the ground by the chest. The chest is a pretty hard bone. Them ribs, that that dog had to have some pretty tough teeth. And I stopped for a minute, you know, because this is a strange dog. This ain't Bo that I expected. This is this is a strange dog. And then it drops the coyote out of its mouth. When it drops that coyote out of its mouth, it leans forward. And it stands up on its hind legs. Almost like an old man standing up out of a rocking chair. Real slow. I didn't hear no bones pop or nothing like that, but just... Real slow. At this point, I ain't hear nothing. I ain't smelling nothing. I'm just seeing this. And it's standing up, it stands up real slow and leans forward. The whole time it's standing up, like it's pulling itself on something. Or like, a, like I said, like an old man at the Cracker Barrel, 80, 90 years old, slowly getting up out of a rocking chair. And it stands up. And I'm thinking in my mind, it's leaning against something. This ain't real. It's not standing up. And then it takes two steps forward on, on two legs. And that's when I noticed its chest. It didn't have a dog's chest. It had an abdomen, you know, a chest like a, like a person. And then directly after that, I noticed its hands. You know, it's pulling its hands up towards it. And it didn't have paws at all. It had hands. And then I could see its face. It was charcoal color, like a like a charcoal that's been hot enough to cook off of on a grill. You know, not not red, but gray. It's, I could see its eyes. It didn't have no no color to it. Just pitch black, like darkness, just eternal a black hole of darkness. And it had blood coating from its mouth all the way down to its chest. It's matted in it, dripping down it like a like a 
candle wax running off a wick, just dripping down. Not not like it was attacking these coats, just attacking it, because I've seen the blood from just a, an attack. Like it was eating it alive while it was attacking these coyotes. And at that point, it takes another step. And that Once it takes that third step, that's when it hit me. This thing is not from this world. And I take off. I turn around, take off running. I'm shining my light before and shining my light back as I'm running. And I got on big gun boots. You hear them just clicking as I'm running through the mountain. And it then it takes off after me. And it probably didn't make it 10 steps before old Jake hit into him. When he hit into him, I, I heard it. I mean, it was a loud pop, and he, he busted. And I shined my light back. When I shined my light back, it just threw him off with one hand like it was a gnat or a fly or something or a flea, like it was just nothing. He rolled back four or five feet. And then it starts coming on after me again. Like it, like I was the only thing that it was interested in in the world was me. And the whole time I'm yelling, put it to him, Jake, put it to him. Come on, Jake, put it to him. And I had my gun strapped to my back. You know, I'm just a 15 year old boy and I knew this thing was way bigger than me. It was two foot higher than me. And I'm five ten. It's close to seven foot. And it's running after me. It ain't making no noise. There's nothing I could hear. And then all of a sudden, as it's as I'm running, old Jake hits him again. And once he hits him again, he fl- flings him off like ain't nothing. One hand. I'm looking forward, looking back the whole time. I'm seeing it clear as a whistle. And he throws him off, just like he just rolls him away. And he's staying on after me. He just continues to run after me. And I'm running with everything I got in me. Every ounce of energy, everything I can muster, my little legs can muster up. And I'm screaming, put it to him, Jake, put it to him, get him, Jake, put it to him, put it to him, Jake. I'm screaming. It. Jake hits him again. When he hits him again, I hear them jaws locked down. And I know that I've heard them jaws locked down a many times in my life. When he hit him again that third time, it was the jaws of death. Because I've heard it many times. And I look back thinking he got him. And whenever I look back, he's hanging. Oh, Jake's hanging onto his thigh. Just like a chihuahua on a mailman. Just hanging. That's how. That's the, the size difference. Because old Jake just wasn't nowhere near as big as this, this, as this thing that's chasing me. And when he did that, when he locked down on him, and I'm watching, that thing grabbed hold of old Jake with both hands. And as sure as I'm telling you today, he threw him through the woods. You can hear him hitting low-hanging tree branches and, and leaves, and you can just hear it and see his body flying. And and I knew at that point that he was dead. That was it. I seen his body go through the woods, and I hear him. I hear his body hitting them limbs and low-hanging tree branches and stuff. That's it. Here I am. I'm all alone. There ain't no one out here in the world that can save me. Daniel Boone himself couldn't come up from the grave and help me. That's it. I'm, I'm, it's just me and, and the monster. I'm running. I'm tore all pieces at this time because I'm thinking he just killed my dog. He's gone. I ain't got nothing in the world that can save me. I've got this gun on my back, and he ain't going to do a lick of good. As I'm running, heading through the woods, I ain't, I, like I said, I'm tore all the pieces. I trip and fall on my belly in a in a treetop. Looked like an oak. Maybe lightning hit it. I'm not sure. And this thing's right behind me at this point on my neck. And the whole time I'm screaming. Come on, old Jake, put it to him. Get him, old Jake, get him. Put it to him. You can do it. And he ain't coming. I'm yelling, yelling. I ran several, several feet. I'm screaming. Come on, come on. He's not coming. He's not coming. And the whole time he's not coming. This thing's gaining ground on me. I mean, it's right on me like a rabbit on a dog track. I couldn't outrun it. There wasn't nothing I could do. I fell on my belly. I hit that treetop that blew over. Lightning hit it. I fell into it, and that thing dropped down all fours. And I'm, at this point, I'm, I'm facing the monster, and it's blowing its breath right on me, right on me. While I was running, I could feel the, the, the breath on the back of my neck, and I got a real good smell of it, really good. And I can tell you to, to this day, I know what type of animal it is. Its breath smelled like 
I don't know if anyone's ever walked up on a buzzard truce in the woods where they're scouting or deer hunting or, or even hiking. But if you walk up on a buzzard spruce where there's one or several buzzards, the vomit that they puke out has a certain distinct smell to it that smells like it's putrid, like rot. And I'm, I'm going backwards screaming with everything I got in me to my voice box about gone. Come on, old Jake. Come on. I need you. Put it to him. Come on. Get him, old Jake. Get him. He ain't coming. He ain't nowhere around. It's just me. And that thing's getting closer to me, snapping, snarling, snot, and that blood dripping off of it, still fresh. And that's it. That's it. It's just me and me and the monster. Point blank. We couldn't have been two, three foot from one another. I'm looking at it in the face. It's looking me and snapping, showing them teeth. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, like a hammerhead shark, old Jake hits him broadside. When he hits him broadside, it sucker rolled over on its back. Old Jake climbed up on top of him and just started just giving it to him. He was just putting it to him, just munching on him. And uh, that thing squalling, snarling going on, and it let off a big howl. Just before it let off that big howl, Old Jake bit him someplace. I don't know where. I'm, I, I like to believe it may be on his hands. When he crushed down, you could hear the bones break. I don't know where he got him at, but but that last lick he hit on him, on his hands or wherever it was, he hit him. And then bones crushed. That's when I knew this was my chance. I stood up and started running out of, them, out of the trees. Fast as I can get with it, back to the truck. I got down to a clearing that was fairly open. That wasn't very far from the truck. I took the gun off my back. And by this point, the whole dynamic had changed. And you could hear that thing. I turned on old Jake and was killing him. I mean killing him. He was squalling, going on, like making noises I ain't never heard. I took that gun off my back, and I'm screaming for him. Come on. Come on, boy. Come on. Come on, let's go. Come on. He ain't coming. Because that thing had a hold of him at that point. Just putting it to him, just hurting him. Awful. Screaming. If I don't know if anyone's ever heard the, the sound of a, a big dog getting killed by another animal, bear, mountain lion, coyotes, anything. It, it was it was ratchet. Make his stomach turn. I I took that gun off the back and I I cracked all six shots that I had left in that rifle. The only six shots I had in that rifle, not left. The only six shots I had, period. Pow, 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 pow. I just rang them off. You can hear them, them shells, uh, you can hear them shells uh, echoing off in mountains as I'm cracking them off. This, uh, the sound of the gun just ringing, and that was it. No other sound, nothing. Not a sound in the world. Couldn't hear crickets. Couldn't hear nothing. There was just nothing. Just dead. Dead silence. Nothing. And I'm yelling, come on, old Jake. Come on. Come on, old Jake. I need you. Come on. It's time to go home. Let's go. He didn't come. I got back down to the truck. Opened up the door and Papa said, what in the world's going on? And I told him what happened. Down to the last detail, what I seen, everything. And I said, Papa, we got to go. We got to get out of here. He said, we got to wait on old Jake and Bo. I said, Papa, old Jake's dead. There ain't no way in the world. He's dead. We got to go. I was tore all to pieces. And then directly when Papa said to me, he said, well, I guess we'll go ahead and leave since you're tore up. After I explained to him what all happened, he looked at me and what his explanation was, what he told me was listen, there's things in these woods that I cannot explain. And if you're wanting to hunt and fish and do outdoor stuff, you got to come to terms with it because it's part of it. And that was a gospel to me. When he, when he spoke, he always spoke words of wisdom. And he took his jacket off and stepped outside the truck and laid his jacket on the ground like he always did. There were several times where we had to leave old Jake. And he laid it there on the ground, 
He said, well, we'll come back in the morning. I see you tore all the pieces. And I said, well, Papa, it's pointless. Old Jake's dead. You know, he fought for me four times. He fought for me. Put his life on the line four times. I said, I ain't coming back in the morning. He said, you have to come back in the morning. If what you told me is true, then you owe it to him. And I thought about it, and I did owe it to him. We went home, went to sleep, got up early in the morning, crack of dawn, went back out there to the same spot. I didn't move from the truck. I rolled down my windows, stayed close to the truck, and I'm yelling, come on, old Jake, come on, can you hear me? Come on, old Jake, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go, nothing. He wasn't laying there on that jacket like he normally was, nothing. He was just gone. My papa was yelling too. Come on, let's go, let's go. Nothing. Just dead silence. So we stayed there, I don't know, 30 minutes or so. We drove up and down the road looking for him. Nothing. No sign of Bo. At this point, I wasn't really that worried about Bo because he'd left Plum out of the world when the coyotes got a hold of him. I don't know where he ran off to. We go back home. Papa said, well, we'll go back out this afternoon and look for him again. I said, all right, Papa, you know, what he said was law anyway. There wasn't nothing I could do at 15 years old. I had to do what he said. We went back out and started yelling. Come on, old Jake, come on. Nothing. Didn't hear nothing. Drove back down to the jacket. Nothing. Listening, waiting, nothing. And directly we heard some rustling in the leaves and the bushes and stuff. On down the road a piece. And that's when we seen a dog step out. Red dog. My papa's back there by the tailgate, the back of the truck standing there. And he yells at me, Well, here comes Bo. Bo standing down there, in the middle of the road. That big red tick dog of yours. So I said, Well, all right, well, I guess I'll get him. And I grab the lead strap and he's walking down the road real slow. Just barely moving. Whenever I walked over and got closer to him, I noticed that it wasn't Bo at all. It was old Jake. And old Jake, and he's just, just blood all over him. He's just matted and coated in it. He's tore all to pieces. But he's alive and his ears look like freshly cooked ramen noodles down on both of them. Just, just nothing, just meat. Just hanging. His chest is ripped open. His nose is about hanging off of, of his face. His tail is gone. He's got big claw marks along his hips. His, and, his, and his hips fractured. His back right hips fractured. He's moving with a severe limp. And I hooked him stuff. And to this day, I've never seen my papa ever pick up another dog. Pick one up. Because he's a tough love guy. He walked over to old Jake. All 120 pounds of his mangled body, just mutilated, and picked him up and didn't put him in the in the dog box. He put him in the back of the truck, and we drove out there. Bo never did come on. And I thought, you know, most people at this point probably would have just would have drove him home and probably put a bullet in his head and put him out of his misery and and buried him, but we didn't. My mamma done a lot of doctoring and nursing stuff on the farm, and she glued his ears up and, and took care of him, kept him in the house for three months. Three months he stayed in the house and recovered him, brought him back to life, you know, brought him back. About three weeks later after that, I got a call from a market that was probably, I don't know, six or seven miles from where we turned loose at, turned the dogs loose. And they said, well, we got your dog down here, your red tick. And I went down there and picked him up, and he, was, he wasn't he was bad. Like, he had, you can see he had a few marks left on him from where the coyotes got a hold of him, but he's in pretty good shape for what all he went through, which probably wasn't as much as old Jake. And to this day, I will always believe that old Jake put his life on the line for me. Not one time, not two times, not three times, four times. He put his life on the line, and I gave up on his life twice, thinking he was dead. But he never did me. At that time, he was five or six years old, and he went on to live 
to be 16 years old. 16 years old. I had to repeat it twice because it's not often that you get a dog that lives to be 16. And we had many adventures together after that. Because as my papa said, it's part of it. You gotta, that's just part of hunting. There's things in the woods that you can't explain. And I seen it firsthand. I'll never be able to explain it. I can only explain it the best I can to you people. In 2009, old Jake passed away. And he, like I said, he lived to be a ripe old age of 16. And I went on to train two more dogs with him and I hunted. A lot of people would have quit and gave up. I took a three month break and I went back at it because it's just part of it. It's part of it. And to me, it'll always be part of it. I don't think this thing's paranormal. I think it's, it's tangible. It's real. Just like, just like a dog or anything else in the world. I think it's real. I've seen it. I know it's real. It's tangible. And several years after old Jake died, I had a second encounter and I was also coon hunting. I was coon hunting around this, these two cliffs that are beside the road that run parallel with the road. There's a cliff on each side of the road. And I started my dogs down this drain. These two other dogs I had at this point, they were pretty good dogs. Nothing like old Jake. They were pretty good. I started them down this drain going around one side of the cliff because this cliff wasn't, wasn't real big. And as I'm going around the drain, they never did hit anything. They never did get out after a coon track or, or any track for that matter. So I'm walking back up there and the dogs are still out milling around, walking around and stuff. And I said, you know what? Instead of walking that drain back out, I'm just going to go back up here on the main road up here. And this is all still in the Daniel Boone National Forest. Cause I'm hearing something just, just around the way. I'm hearing something in the ditch. So I walk around that main road thinking, well, you know, that might be a coon. And I'm by myself. No one's with me. My papa at this point's already dead and gone, left this world, got called way up yonder. And so I walk around the cliff out to the main road. And I'm standing in the main road walking this mountain pass, I guess is what you can call it. Cliff on each side on the left and on the right. I'm hearing something over in the ditch. As I start walking out through there, another one of them things jump out. Another one of the dog men. It's standing right in the middle of the road. It's not as big. It's probably six six, six seven, maybe six eight. Not real good with height, but he's pretty large. But definitely nowhere near as big as, as the one I see in my first encounter, and I get a good look at it. I, I, for some reason, I guess I'd already come to terms with it, and I knew that they're out there. And from what my papa said, I have to take the good with the bad. If I love hunting, then there's a chance I'm going to see something ugly. And it's standing out there in the middle of the road, same color, charcoal. I get a good look at its feet. It's got the dog-like bent legs, bent back. I see its hands. I'm, it's just looking at me, and I'm looking at it. It's not showing its teeth. It's not snarling. Its eyes are pitch black. Same as the other one. You know, and the first one, I I was so close to him that I didn't see if the shine from my light off of its eyes because I was too close. And if you're so close to an animal and you shine a light on it, its eyes will not reflect light. And this one, I'm far enough for it to reflect light, and it's not. It's just pitch black eyes. It's looking at me, and I'm looking at it. Looks like the same exact type of creature. It is the same exact type of creature, but it's not the exact creature that I seen on the first experience because it just wasn't as big. And it's looking at me and then directly behind me, I start hearing toenails, a clanking on the ground, just click, 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 click. And it's my male dog. I was hunting with a male dog and a female dog at night. He walks up behind me. He's just standing there. He'd never seen one of these things, not that I knew of. He's just standing right behind, right behind me, just looking, same as I was. He wasn't, he wasn't cowered down or nothing. He was just looking. And whenever he come up next to me, 
that dog man takes a cut to the left and climbs straight up that cliff face. It's every bit of 60 foot. Just climbs straight up it. I don't know if it's scared or if it just wanted to not be seen, but it just climbed straight up the cliff face. Just straight up. I mean, 60 foot. That's a, that's a good haul. Now I turn around after that. I walk back to the truck, load up the dogs. I left that country and I ain't never been deep back in there. That wasn't as deep. The second encounter was not as far back in Daniel Boone. This happened closer to the main road. Just a little ways in Daniel Boone. And that was my second encounter. The second time I seen it. And I honestly believe that the Daniel Boone National Forest is filled with them. I mean filled with them. And for my third encounter, I did not actually see one. My third encounter, my neighbor, Big John, stands about six foot four. He's a pretty good sized fella. We were going into the flats of Daniel Boone. It's what we call the flats where there's just not as much mountains. We were going in there to see if we can scout for a good spot to bow hunt at. You know, we walked back in the woods along a, along the edge of a creek, probably a mile and a half, maybe two miles, but I doubt it. Probably a mile, mile and a half. We're looking around for sign and stuff. We ain't seen very much sign or nothing. So we start heading back out the same exact way we come in, right along the creek, right along. As we're going in, we're looking the whole time for, for deer tracks and sign, you know, funnels, little saddles and stuff that they might travel through, but we didn't see nothing. As we're traveling back, I look down and I see these tracks. I say, look at that, John. John said, buddy, that is a big animal. And he bent down and he said, here, take a picture. And he wears that size extra large glove. And Vic's got the pictures. I sent him the pictures. This happened last year. And it's a great big animal. You could see its feet pretty good. And it was fresh. I mean, it followed us. This animal stalked us. And I knew from the way that it stalked us that it was, in fact, another dog man. I'm going to say maybe an adolescent's. Because its feet were definitely not big enough to be a full mature dog man. And we tracked this animal's foot tracks down to the creek, inside the actual creek. We went over to the other side of the creek. We looked. No tracks. And it's smart enough to walk that creek out. It stayed in the creek. It did not come out of the creek. So it walked down the creek. It followed us so far. And went down in the creek and, and walked the creek out. Because you can't see from the area that we were walking, you can't see down inside of the creek. You can see the creek, but you and you know it's there, but you cannot actually see down inside the creek. And each track was spaced out. And in Big John's mind, he says, buddy, this thing takes a big stride, don't it? And I said, yeah, yeah, it takes a big stride. And I didn't tell him. I didn't tell him what's in the woods. You know, it ain't my place. But I didn't tell him what was in the woods. You know, I knew exactly what it was by its tracks, how far it's space that it was. And in them pictures, you'll see Big John's hand. He wears a size extra large glove. And that, and that sucker's pretty good size. It's bigger than, than any coyote. Great big track. And his feet, his lower legs on the ones I seen, on the one I seen, I didn't see the first encounter. I didn't see his lower legs. I wasn't paying attention to that part. I'm paying attention to its other upper half. It's all bloody and scary, you know. And I know that it has hind legs like a dog's. And that was my third experience. Well, Kyle, words can't do justice to how sorry I am to hear about what you and Jake went through with that first experience. The other experiences you had to go through as well, that is rough. I've got a lot of questions that I want to ask you, but unfortunately we're out of time. Would you be willing to come back next week and do another show where I can ask you those questions? Yeah, Vic, I should be able to. just depends on what's going on, but I'm pretty sure that I could probably get back up with you again. Okay, good. I appreciate it. Before we get out of here, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Well. 
We buried old Jake in 2009 at the mouth of a holler out on my mamma and papa's farm. Now it's just my mamma's farm because my papa's done left his world too. Every time I go over to my mamma's property, the farm, and I look over at the mouth of the holler where we buried old Jake in 2009, I always remember what he done for me that night and to this day and for always. I feel like he saved my life, and he put it on the line for me over and over again. We shared a special connection till the day he died, thick and thin. I was with him about every day. And even whenever he wasn't able to hunt no more, he got too old to hunt. He still stayed right with me. And I'll never forget the battle in the backwoods that night and what he done for me. Well, there's no denying the fact that Jake was a special dog, and I can only imagine how much you miss him. Having said that, thanks again so much for coming on, and try to have a good night.